Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, session of the Mexican Studies Seminar. My name is Emilio Curi. I'm director of the CAT Center at the University of Chicago. And uh, today I'm uh, very pleased to welcome back uh, to the seminar uh, our friend Eric Bagnon. Uh, looking at the people who are gathered here today, I see that he really does need no introduction. He is Distinguished uh, Professor of History Emeritus at the University of California, San Diego. Without question, uh, one of the leading uh, historians uh, of modern Mexico writing today, the author of several uh, important, in some ways, field-defining books um, in the history of modern Mexico, uh, known for uh, his deep research and the range uh, of his interests. Uh, he's certainly someone who has left uh, an indelible mark uh, on the historiography of Mexico, uh, both in the United States and in Mexico. And today, uh, I, I should say also uh, as a point of pride uh, that maybe some of you know it, maybe you don't, but Eric is, uh, I hope, a proud graduate of the College of the University of Chicago. Uh, and so it, it's a welcome back in that way uh, as well. He was here a number of years ago um, in person uh, when uh, he was beginning or was along the way in this uh, project uh, about Lucas Alaman, which has now happily concluded. And he's joining us today um, to talk about this great new book uh, that has recently been pu published uh, entitled A Life Together, Lucas Alaman and Mexico, 1792-1853. As always, uh, we will have a presentation for the first half an hour or so, and then we'll open the floor to your questions and comments. So with that, uh, welcome back, Eric. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Oops, okay, i just leave that alone. Thank you very much, Emilio. Um, I, I thank you very much for setting this up. I know, uh, it's an ongoing seminar, but it always takes some, some effort to do that. And I thank uh, any of you who are here uh, watching and uh, listening. I plan to talk for about, I don't know, 20 minutes or 25 minutes, a half hour at most. Uh, so then we can open it up for discussion. And as Amelia pointed out, I am an alumnus of the, the college, uh, actually the class of 1967, which it seems like really ancient ancient uh, uh, history. So it's always uh, nice, nice to be back. Um, at the risk of narcissistic self-indulgence, uh, and this is particularly aimed at any graduate students who might be listening, um, sometimes uh, uh, it's difficult or impossible or you never know the origin of work that you're reading or, or discussing. So I thought I might very briefly outline the genealogy of this project uh, so that you can see that people go down blind alleys, uh, as some of you may uh, experience, and some even of my senior colleagues here have experienced. Um, the, the, book, the book basically, uh, and I, won't, I don't expect any of you to, have, or many, if any of you at all, to have read the book yet. Um, but the, the, the genealogy of the book, it owes its existence in large measure to Enrique Florescano, who is, at least in my view, the dean of living Mexican historians. Uh, about 50 years ago, I was a research assistant. I was a graduate student at Berkeley, and I was a research assistant for David Brading, who was then at Berkeley. Uh, and we went to Mexico and we worked on a project on, in the archives in Morelia about uh, tithes in the, Archbishop, in the bishopric of uh, Morelia. And uh, we, at Brading had an equipo and, uh, uh, which was consisted of me and Florescano had a team of students, I think from the Colegio de Mexico. He took me driving in the countryside one afternoon, just the two of us, and I was casting around for a topic to do an agrarian history of uh, colonial, late colonial Mexico, since that's where my interests had gravitated. And he suggested, well, why not look at Guadalajara? The archives are wonderful. They haven't been much used for this. It's not much frequented by North American historians, and it would be a good site. So uh, that's, in fact, where I went. And I did a study of haciendas 
in the greater uh, Guadalajara region, that basin of, the, of uh, Lake Chapala and, and its uh, extended hinterland. And that got me interested in the Pueblos along the lake front, the lake sides of Lake Chapala. Some of you will know the geography, Lake Chapala lies south of Guadalajara. Uh, they were continually in, prof, in, in, in conflict with the haciendas of the area for reasons that we all know very well and that Emilio probably m m more than anyone because he's doing an extensive study of, uh, of uh, Pueblos in, in Mexico and the, the relationship of Pueblo and Hacienda has always been a very problematic one. So that got me interested in the lakeside Pueblos and they were very active in the insurgency in 1810 to 21. Uh, so uh, that got me interested in looking at the uh, movement for independence, the insurgency, and that took me to Lucas Alamán's uh, Historia de México, which is basically a five volume history of the insurgency of 1810 to 21 with a long prolegomenon on the, on the colonial period and a, and a longish uh, coda on everything up to about 18, 1850. Uh, so I did this study then on uh, the movement for independence called the Other Rebellion, which came out about 20 years ago. And when I was done with it, I was casting around for another topic and I had found that I was very frustrated finally in, in not being able to probe more the interior uh, lives of the insurgents whom I studied common people, particularly indigenous people in, 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 that, in many areas of Mexico. So I thought, well, I'll do a project in which I can, and I'm not talking about doing psychohistory here. I'm talking about looking at people's internal mental processes. Uh, so uh, I decided, well, I'll do a, a, a study. What, what better to do than a study of uh, Mexican psychiatry? And I started working in the archive of the Castañeda, which was the psychiatric hospital opened in 1910 uh, in the last year of the Porfirio Diaz regime. Uh, and I figured, well, I'll look at the internal world of the mad. But I realized uh, after, after uh, a couple of weeks doing that, I didn't have the faintest idea what I was doing. So I decided I took a right turn, as it were, into biography and having read Aleman and realizing his importance, both as historian, statesman, public intellectual, entrepreneur, uh, I decided to work on Luc Lucas Aleman. Now, uh, in, in that sense, the book embodies a paradox because Aleman was one of the least self-revelatory uh, of public figures. He was very uh, reserved, one might even say closed. And uh, as it happens, uh, the documentary sources that I used for this book uh, are, are not, not very revealing of what, what I was looking for, which was a way of dealing with the interiority of some historical historical figure. Uh, there isn't much in the way of personal correspondence of his left. There is some, uh, but uh, it's, it's really not very uh, revealing. He didn't keep any diaries. He himself commented on the fact that uh, the diaristic tradition in, in, in the Hispanic, in the Hispanophone world was not well developed with a few rare exceptions. Uh, he did leave a mountain of public and state papers, voluminous historical writings, uh, the three volumes of his Dissertaciones sobre la Historia de, de la República Mexicana, which deals with the colonial period, and then, of course, his five-volume history. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of public papers and a lot of state papers. One of the most revealing sources was actually his 30-year-long correspondence with the Duque de Terranova y Monteleone, who was also the 14th Marquez del Valle de Oaxaca. He was, the, uh, he was a Neapolitan nobleman who lived in, in, in Palermo and was the heir to the vast properties still existent in that time of uh, uh, Hernando Cortes. Um, I'm sort of getting into the, into, the, into the weeds here, but I thought I would, I would uh, open with a little introduction about this. We can discuss anyone who's interested, uh, particularly the graduate students, if, if there are any listening, we can discuss the process of biography and what's, what's involved with it later on. Well, let me move on then to, to briefly uh, discuss what I think are the contributions of the book. Um, 
in some ways it it reinforces the conclusions of the last and only uh, actually it's not the only but it's the only serious kind of monumental uh, biography of Alaman that was published in 1938 by Jose Balades. Uh, the name will be familiar to, to many of you. He was a, a man of the left, a diplomat, um, a, uh, uh, an academic at certain points in his life, and a very prolific historian on the history on the history uh, writer on the history of Mexico. Much of it in a in a, a biographical vein. Well, in 1938. He published uh, a biography of Lucas Alaman. Um, I don't remember the, the exact title. It's Estadista Historiador or something to that effect. And it's uh, given Valadez's own political orientation. It really is a remarkably, aside from being a good book, it's it's quite extended. It's it's quite detailed, but it's also very balanced and even admiring of uh, Lucas Alaman. Uh, and uh, it, there's, there's a good deal of biographical detail in it. Unfortunately, it's not sourced very well in the, in the book itself, so it's difficult to know what, what the actual sources were that, that uh, Valadez used, but my own trail of investigation has crossed his in a number of points, so I was able to verify that he really made very good use and, and uh, 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 judicious use of sources that I also used for my work. One of which, uh, which has never been published and is not widely known, is a fragment, a, a long fragment of an autobiography that Alman wrote when he was uh, in hiding in Mexico City in the in the early 1830s from prosecution for his involvement in the death of Vicente Guerrero in 1831. Uh, he hid out for about 15 months or so. It's not entirely clear where, but we think that it was a, uh, it may have been at the home of uh, the uh, American envoy at that time with whom he had forged actually a cordial uh, relationship, ironically enough, for reasons that I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Anyway, this uh, uh, long fragment of autobiography uh, eventually mutated into his uh, magisterial Historia de Mexico. Uh, along the way, it, it really began as a personal memoir, uh, as, a, as an autobiography, and there's a lot of material in it about his family uh, and his view of where his family fit into Mexican history and the old silver-based uh, Mexican uh, aristocracy of which he was a scion. Uh, and in fact, the autobiography, I think, is a, is a key. I won't I don't want to exaggerate its importance as an insight into Alamán, but it does indicate uh, a very strong kind of melancholic uh, quality of nostalgia for the for the for the lapsed grandeur of his family. Um, he, one of his uh, great grandfathers was ennobled, uh, and uh, you know that 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 title traveled down through the family, but was extinguished in the 1820s along with other aristocratic titles. Anyway, that's a very revealing document. And I know that Valadez used it and I found it very, uh, very useful. So um, getting to the substantive conclusions of the book, at least, uh, at least briefly, uh, Aleman, of course, has, has uh, in, in the historiography of Mexico and recently in some quite, uh, I thought, amusing exchanges between uh, Enrique Krause and uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, each of whom accused the other of being uh, uh, like Lucas Alamán, kind of meaning, meaning to kind of uh, tarnish uh, the other person in the, in the, in the dialogue. Uh, Alaman has always been painted as a reactionary, uh, as the kind of bete noir of uh, Mexican political history. Uh, one of the findings of all of this, and, and one of my own, is that in fact, uh, he was personally speaking more a nostalgic, conservative, modernizer than a reactionary. That is to say that he, he really never wanted, despite the fact that he was something of an apologist for the colonial period and that's been one of the main charges against him. 
he never really wanted to return to colonial institutions and his 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 treatment of, of the colonial uh, era although uh, quite positive in many ways in the in the uh, uh, the first 100 and, or 150 pages of his Historia de Mexico was not an uncritical treatment. Um, an, uh, another piece of evidence in, in, in painting him a, a reactionary, of course, was his late life monarchism. Uh, in the 1840s, he was involved briefly in a, in a, a conspiracy, a plot, which, which really came to nothing. Uh, along with Bermudez de Castro, the then uh, Spanish envoy to Mexico, uh, to reinstate uh, a monarchy in Mexico. But, but Aleman earlier in his career, earlier in his public life had really been a moderate uh, centralist Republican. The, these monarchical leanings of which he was accused by uh, many liberals, particularly people like uh, uh, Lorenzo de Zavala or, uh, uh, some other people um, were, were really those leanings really materialized quite quite late in his in his uh, in his public life. Um, he was, as I said earlier, a moderate centralist Republican. In uh, his first stints in the government as as chief minister in the government and the government first of uh, the transition between Iturbide and uh, the Republic. And then in the early years of the Guadalupe Victoria government, he really uh, was perfectly prepared to work within a Republican framework and did so quite effectively for a long time. Um, he even worked under the Federalist Constitution of 1824 for a period. Uh, and my, my own evaluation of his leaving the government in 1825 is there was really more of a reaction to the meddling political uh, uh, activities of the American uh, envoy, Joel Poinsett, with whom Aleman had, had a, a famously uh, negative relationship. Uh, Poinsett, of course, was instrumental in stimulating the, uh, the growth of Masonic politics in Mexico, which we know split into, it was in two groups, the, uh, the York Rite and the Scottish Rite, the Scottish Rite being more conservative New York right being more radical. Aleman was never a, a Mason, by the way, as far as I can determine. So I think it was less, uh, it was less a reaction to uh, the signs of liberalism as such or republicanism that, that turned Aleman off the government as it was uh, the, the problems with Poinsett, uh, who's, who's meddling in, in Mexican domestic affairs uh, uh, Aleman found, you know, not only against the tradition of, of uh, good diplomatic practice, but just, uh, you know, kind of uh, a very negative influence for the time and, and place when Mexico was in, the, in, a, in a transition uh, from monarchical to Republican, Republican forms. But I think, I think uh, and, and he himself addressed this in his writing, I think Aleman was what I referred to as a situational rather than an essential monarchist. Uh, his, his monarchism or his inclination towards monarchism was a product of his own disillusionment with Republican forms. And anyone who's familiar with the politics of the, particularly of the 1830s and 40s, which uh, Aleman himself said should be referred to as the age of Santa Ana, will know that it was very chaotic and uh, Aleman's own personal preoccupation in his public papers and his correspondence uh, was the, uh, the constant uh, threat and, and actual existence of, of uh, political anarchy in the country. Uh, will Fowler, uh, the, his, the uh, historian of Mexico at St. Andrews University has traced the number of political uh, upri military uprisings during these periods, and sometimes they peaked at hundreds of years. Now, none of or few of them ever embraced uh, a real political program or wide uh, adherence, but it, it was a very chaotic, a very chaotic period. And I think Aleman became very preoccupied with this in his writings it shows through in his public paper, papers and speeches. Um, so I, I think it, it was his disillusionment with the uh, 
with, with Republican politics and the kind of instability that, uh, they, that he felt they had introduced that really turned him uh, fairly late in his life, in his, in his uh, 50s, uh, towards monarchism as a possible solution for, in, for uh, instilling uh, uh, more stable uh, forms of, of, of government. Now, the question is uh, why he turned in that direction. Uh, aside from the factors that I mentioned. Uh, and I think the major reason is that for Aleman, work in politics, uh, his own public life, and his uh, alarm at the direction that uh, Mexican politics had taken, its instability for you know, more, about two decades, um, I, think he, I think he found that uh, incompatible with the sort of economic development and modernization that he favored. So I think Aleman was less interested in the exercise of power as such, uh, as an instrumentality of reaction, for example, and that's the way he's been painted. I think his North was always modernization through economic development. So um, I think his, his, authoritarian tend, his authoritarian tendencies when he was again in the government in, in the early 1830s were more oriented towards uh, establishing political stability as the, as, the, as the sine qua non, the basis for uh, uh, developing economic modernization. That was always his North. Uh, and the form that modernization was to take uh, was very much in Alman's mind related to uh, industrialization, which of course was taking place very rapidly in the United States uh, and in, in the North Atlantic uh, in, in general. Um, and I think Alman, when he was particularly in the government in the early 1830s, famously tried to uh, force march industrialization in Mexico and the entering wedge for this was his famous project for the Banco de Avio, which was essentially a development bank funded by uh, uh, tariffs on imported uh, textiles into Mexico. Uh, and, the, and the money that was gathered that way was to be reallotted to um, uh, textile enterprises in Mexico. Now, uh, this had, very mixed results. There's a, a wonderful book of economic history by uh, Potash on, on the Banco de Avio. Uh, it existed for about 10 years. Uh, Aleman established it when he was in the government in 1830. Uh, the funding was not sufficient to meet the ambitions that he had for it. And there was a good deal of cronyism involved. Uh, the, direct, the board of directors were Aleman's friends and colleagues, and a lot of the money was allotted to uh, people that he knew. But when you consider that, that there was no viable banking system at the time, personal relationships and networks were essential uh, to the kind of uh, development that he wanted to foster. Uh, he wanted to do this to uh, alleviate Mexico's economic dependence on the export of silver, which of course had been the main engine of the economy during the, during the colonial period. He actually tried to revive the silver economy himself, the silver mining economy, which had been damaged uh, almost fatally by the insurgency. He tried to revive that on the basis of British investment in the eight, late 1820s. And there was a five year period when he was the Mexican director of a, of a large consortium of, of uh, mining investors called the, um, I forgot now what the, what the name of it is, ironically enough, I spent a lot of time writing about it. Anyway, there were a lot of British investors uh, and that took place over and th there were, you know, the equivalent of hundreds of millions of, of pounds in, 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 in modern uh, uh, money invested in the mines in Guanajuato and Zacatecas and in other areas, but most of it was a bust. Uh, and Aleman got out of it by, by 1830 or so, not having realized for himself or for the country the kind of prosperity that he hoped a revival of mining would, would produce. And I should say here that he, of course, uh, most of you or some of you may know this, 
came from a, a, a mining background. I mentioned this, he was from Guanajuato. Uh, his family had made, made and lost fortunes in the silver mining industry. Uh, and he himself at various periods of his life had hoped to recoup some of the family fortunes and vanished glories through the revival of the silver mining industry, but never managed to do it. So uh, he was trying to reorient the Mexican economy away from its dependent upon primary exports, basically silver, uh, and uh, to spur uh, uh, domestic industrialization. And of course, in, in Europe and particularly in Britain, but also in the United States, the entering wedge for that had been in the textile industry. It's a consumer non-durable that employs a lot of people uh, and it's a, it's a, it, it, it began the process of industrialization in, in several places and he hoped to, uh, to emulate that. Uh, but that's not the only thing he did to stimulate industrialization. He was the head of a, the Junta de Industria in the 1840s. Uh, it was a government agency that was supposed to stimulate uh, industrialization. Uh, it opened a school for uh, uh, industrial arts. Uh, it put on a number of expositions of uh, domestic industrial products, and, and it was it was it compiled statistics and wrote reports. Uh, its its effects were were limited, but it was all that Alaman could do given the resources uh, uh, that he controlled at the moment. So uh, this is this is one of the areas in the book that uh, I went to in in, in some detail where uh, Alamon's uh, uh, efforts to stimulate in industrialization and I think I've uh, opened this up in ways that uh, good as it is Potash's book was not able to do and other people who've alluded to this I think at this period and, and gone into it have, have not been able to do. Um, a second thing I've gone into is. Uh, in the book is, is Alamon's shady political reputation. I've already alluded to this. He's been painted as a reactionary. Uh, and I think that's more from what he wrote rather than what he did. He did have authoritarian tendencies when he, when he was in the government, but uh, that was in reaction to what he viewed as anarchy. Now, one man's anarchy is another's uh, free play of political opinion, but from Alamon's point of view, the, the perennial instability in the government uh, was a, uh, undermined the basis for the sort of modernization he wanted to uh, achieve. Uh, one of the things uh, held most against him, of course, as I mentioned before, was his involvement in the death of Vicente Guerrero in 1831. Uh, and I go into this in considerable detail in the book. Uh, it's always been thought that Alamán was the prime mover in what was basically a, a kind of a judicial murder of Vicente Guerrero, who was captured by treachery and then uh, accused of various crimes and eventually ed executed in February of, of 1831. Uh, Alamán, in fact, uh, was peripherally instrumental in this. The main mover was uh, the war minister in the Bustamante cabinet of 1830 <clears throat> and 1831, a man named Facio, an Alamán, uh, actually facilitated this uh, with you by use of some funds from a slush fund that he controlled. He was the Minister of the Interior and Exterior Relations at the time, but he was not the prime mover. He can be blamed for kind of uh, a somewhat more than passive uh, facilitation of the elimination of Guerrero, but he certainly was not the prime mover. He's also been blamed uh, for his uh, uh, linkages with uh, Antonio Lopez de Santana, particularly bringing Santana back to power for the last time in 1853, Alamán wrote a famous letter having founded the Conservative Party, inviting Santana back to power. And Santana was already on his way and Alamán was appointed the chief minister in the government. Uh, and, and Santana might not have spun out of control uh, over the next couple of years had Alamán not died about six weeks into his administration. Uh, in fact, Alamán had a rather low opinion of Santana. I'm not sure what Santana thought of him, but they used each other over a period of a couple of decades to each of them to further his own political uh, ambitions. 
Uh, so that's a, 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 another area in the book that I've, I've looked at. Uh, I've also looked at, on, and this is something that's not been done very much before. I've looked at Alamon as an entrepreneur. Uh, here he connected in ways that I've alluded to the past with the future. He wanted to recover the, the, the tarnished glories of his, his, his uh, ancestors and, and his family in Guanajuato. But he also looked, as I mentioned, uh, almost ad nauseum to the modernization of the country. Um, and I think his, his nostalgia for the, the, the lost glories of his family, the extinguished uh, no, title of nobility, the loss of uh, the family fortune, caused him as an entrepreneur to overreach several times in his own uh, activities. Uh, he did this in his attempt to revive mining in the 1820s, where he hoped to reap some profit from it, obviously. He was very honest about it. But that was a bust. He bought an hacienda in the late 1820s, held on to it for a decade or 12 years or so, was an improving landlord. This was in the area of the Paquillo. Uh, and that proved to be a bust. And he said it was the worst investment he ever made. And then finally, in the late 1830s up to 1840 or so, he was the managing director of an enormous textile enterprise uh, uh, in, uh, on, the, on the coast uh, called uh, Cocolapan. It was a huge textile factory. Uh, and because of uh, problems with supply of cotton and some bad uh, investment decisions and some externalities, the whole thing went into bankruptcy. Uh, so those are three instances in which as an entrepreneur, I think he, he failed to realize his own uh, uh, ambitions. And then just to uh, very briefly uh, finish up here, I want, I, the book devotes at least a couple chapters, and I've written other things on this too. There's an article of mine just coming out in the journal of, uh, co uh, it's called Corpus 21 of the Colegio Mexiquense. Uh, it looks at Alman's, what I call Alman's historical project, particularly in terms of his relationship to Carlos Maria de Bustamante, who was one of the major chroniclers of the independence period, and actually a friend of Alamans, uh, and also the influence on Alamans, thinking of Edmund Burke, the Irish uh, parliamentarian of the uh, late 18th century. As a historian, he's really not much read today. Uh, it's, it's Bustamante who became the, the, the kind of quarry for other historians and for parts of the, of the, of the covering national mythology about uh, the independence period. Uh, if, for example, you look at uh, the, the book by Enrique Florescano of the histories of, of uh, history in Mexico, Alamán comes in as a, as a historical actor, but not much as a writer. And, and uh, um, Forescano devotes much more attention to other contemporaries of his, such as Bustamante, for example. As a historian, Alamán traced what he saw as uh, Republican Mexico's problems with anarchy to the virtue, what he saw as a virtual jacquerie in the independence period led by uh, Hidalgo. Uh, he characterized Hidalgo basically as a sort of a bumbling egghead who unleashed uh, uh, forces that he could not control. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Alamán felt that, uh, Al that independence was inevitable. He's very clear about this. Uh, and his, his, uh, the main theme of his Historia de México, those uh, magisterial five volumes, is that uh, the nature of the insurgency is a hyper-violent movement racked by class and, and, and racial hatreds. Essentially, as I've said, a, a jacquerie um, that that had sent Mexico down along along the the path to the anarchy that that and factional and political factionalism and instability that Alamán saw plaguing the country, the republic, uh, in the in the early republican period. Um, the book was basically in part a refutation of the work of Carlos Maria de Bustamante, who romanticized the movement uh, a good deal. Uh, and the influence of Burke uh, is seen at every, every turn uh, uh, in, in the book uh, that uh, uh, political institutions need to be organic and not experimental. And that's the way Alamán viewed not only the, 
the ideological leanings of the of the movement for insurgency, but also the 1824 Constitution and some other political experience experimentations that came that came after it. I think I'm going to break off there. I've already gone on too long, and uh, I'm happy to entertain questions or comments and discussion. And Emilio is going to be our anfitrión. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um for those comments. Uh, it is indeed a, a fascinating book. I hope if you haven't done so, you will take the time uh, to read it. We'll open the floor for questions and comments, just as you've already started doing it. Raise your hand on Zoom. Benjamin, you're first. Hi, uh, thank you, Professor, for talking. Uh, I've really enjoyed the uh, parts of your book that I've, I've read. Um, I wanted to go back to one of the points that you briefly mentioned on this uh, perhaps connection between Aleman psychology and his uh, political ideology. Um, I understand on the one hand that he feared the masses, but much like other leaders at the time, but you also frequently in the text tease out this understanding that Aleman had a kind of racialized view of the masses and you can see it uh, concisely uh, when he talks about Vicente Guerrero being the leader of, of, a, of a caste war against uh, European descendants. And so I wanted to probe a bit more into this uh, and how you got to this conclusion. Do you think that it was in part his personal circumstances, the way he experienced uh, the insurgency as a young man that affected uh, his, his viewpoint? Or do you also uh, manage to see a broader current that, that also had this racialized view of uh, the insurgency and the masses at this time? That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, interestingly enough, there is not a good, there, there's not a lot of, 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 uh, of um, explicit kind of racially infused discussion in the Historia de Mexico. It's there, you have to, I mean, you know, he refers to the plebe in a, in a very dis, kind of stain, disdainful way and his, his portrayal as, a, as you mentioned and as I mentioned of, of uh, the violence, you know, he, he talks about Hidalgo's army, for example, as like uh, uh, an Asiatic horde. And behind that, of course, is the you know the kind of sav the invocation of savagery and all that kind of thing. It's it's very it's very racialized. Now, I think your your point, or at least what I took implicitly from your point, is that Aleman shared widely held attitudes of his of his class. I mean, he was uh, you know he was he was of. Uh, really undiluted European Spanish background. His father was a Spaniard uh, who had emigrated as a young man, which was very typical. Uh, and the very fact that he himself was from this uh, aristocratic background that had always, I mean, formally aristocratic, that had always emphasized its European roots, uh, you know, uh, disposed him towards these, these uh, racial attitudes. Um, I, it, I think it's probably safe to characterize him as uh, having racialist attitudes, whether he was a racist as such. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, that may be a distinction without, without a difference. So I think, uh, I think there was a combination. Oh, I know, I know. And the, and the question you asked related to his experience uh, with the insurgency itself. Uh, there's been a good deal ascribed to this. Basically, when Hidalgo's forces took Guanajuato in late 1810, uh, Alamán describes him, him, this himself in, in some detail, uh, a group of, uh, of insurgents whom he doesn't necessarily characterize as, as indigenous people, uh, came into his house uh, <clears throat> and sort of roughed him up a bit. Uh, he describes the, the situation. And, and in the book, I try to kind of examine whether in fact this is responsible for his uh, attitudes about, you know, his, his, his uh, pervasive attitude that Mexican politics was anarchic and that uh, uh, Guerrero had led a class, you know, the whole thing that you've, that you've uh, discussed, the kind of infusion of, of political life with, uh, with uh, uh, 
you know, kind of racial racial savagery uh, dating back to you know, kind of indigenous heritage. Uh, myself, I don't think that he had anything uh, like, for example, PTSD, and I go into this in the book from being roughed up by the insurgents. I think I think I think his attitudes were cumulative rather than uh, rather than traumatic, uh, and I think uh, he observed the violence uh, during, particularly during the capture of Guanajuato, uh, the killing of uh, a, a great many people that he knew and respected and that had family connections with. So I think it's a combination both of personal experience and aristocratic background and a generally held attitude by, by aristocratic Creoles of the, of the period, rather than uh, the immediate experience as, as a sole determinant of, of his attitudes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, we have several questions left. So if you could be brief yeah, your sorry. questions, we'll get to all of them. Dane, you're next. Hi, Eric. Uh, my my Morgan. question is, uh, if Lucas Aleman is a more nuanced and complex person than I used to think, who should I take now as the archetypal ideal type conservative in early 19th century Mexico? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, Gutierrez de Estrada, for example. Uh, you know, who uh, uh, famously later on was uh, head of the uh, 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 embassy that invited Maximiliano to, to come to the country. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Well, Gutierrez de Estrada is, is, an is, a, is a good example. Uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to think, for the moment I'm, 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 I'm somewhat at a, at a loss. I think, I think, you know, in terms of our, our in terms of, uh, somebody who would fit, fit the mold, a monarchist, uh, imbibing with uh, uh, attitudes, more rigid attitudes than even Aleman had about social hierarchy and forms of deference uh, with uh, kind of more traditional economic forms, uh, uh, putting Mexico as, as an economic uh, reaction, keeping Mexico uh, as an exporter of, uh, of, you know, kind of precious minerals and things like that. I think, I think uh, there are a number of people like that. I think Gutierrez de Estrada, Gutierrez de Estrada would, be, would be a good example. Do you, do you want me to uh, elaborate on that or do you, do you have a, an observation or, I'm sorry, I mean, maybe I'm... No, no, that's good. That's Good. Let's let's move on. Juan, you're next. Yes, I have two very straightforward uh, questions. The the, the 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 first is, so what do you think is sort of the most important legacy of beyond his ideas of, of Lucas Alaman for the for the Mexican state or for or for politics in Mexico? Like like being a Chilean, for example, we always talk about Diego Portales and these conservative figures as sort of giving us the shape. Of the say he gave us the key, right? He gave us the key. Yeah. Doesn't matter how liberal you are. He gave us the key to understand how the state works in in Latin. What is what is the legacy of Alaman in, in statehood? And and the second straightforward question is having yourself work on a historical process and a character around the first half of the nineteenth century. What do you think a biography allows us to kind of understand about a period that sort of you couldn't get to? Or writing the other rebellion or, or this type of books. So what does yeah. the biography add to our insight of a, of a period? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the first question, what's his legacy? I think, uh, and it's, it's interesting that you asked that because uh, actually tomorrow I'm having a conversation with, with some Chilean uh, historians in Santiago uh, about, about Alamán and about the book. And in fact, uh, the parallelism, which I invoke in the book, it's not very deep with Portales is, is, is there, um, you know, kind of uh, an authoritarian state to impose stability uh, to some degree to open out to the rest of the world, but to keep a lid on politics. 
uh, particularly and, and you know, uh, very anti-democratic, obviously. Um, hmm. You know, much of this, of course, is uh, comes to reality only with the Porfirian regime. Much of what much of what uh, uh, Alman sought to do uh, uh, is is realized under under Porfirio Diaz. Now Diaz, of course, at least had the 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 covering fig, fig leaf of of a, of a democratic republican form, although we know that it was in some, some ways rather rather hollow. I, I think I think the leg I think the legacy of 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 Alaman, interestingly enough, is uh, more in line with the Edmund Burke that is often misunderstood as a pure reactionary rather than uh, a flexible conservative. Uh, so I think a strong I think a strong state structure is what Alaman advocated certainly modernization through industrialization. I think those, those would be two. Uh, and, and finally, as a historian or rather, uh, and this is a legacy that's, that's, that's sometimes not acknowledged, a rather kind of melancholy fatalist view of Mexican history. Now he was not to see, uh, you, you know, I mean, you, you, you could, you could qualify that or throw it out completely looking at modern Mexico, or you could say that, you know, a lot of it has, has, has uh, still uh, survived. But I think that's, uh, that's part of his legacy. So, so modernization, a strong state structure, and a rather melancholy view of, of the course of Mexican history. Now, in terms of biography, that's a, really an interesting question because I'm not, I'm a historian who wrote a biography rather than a biographer. I'm not sure that there is finally that much of a distinction. I've discussed this with some friends, some, some colleagues. Uh, the other sorts of history I've done have been the straight economic history about haciendas and then social and a little bit of cultural history about the insurgency. Uh, I, I don't want to, I'm, I, I've done much in my career as a historian to try to uh, consolidate the trend away from great person history, great man history. But uh, I think in fact, uh, I think, I think the, the, the story of Alamon's life since he was such a key player, even though I think in the end, as I point out in the biography, I think he failed. I think he was a failure, basically. Uh, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't build a strong state structure. His efforts at modernization were very halting uh, and were really only fully realized after the, after the coming of the railroads. Uh, so, um, but I think he was such a key player and such an intelligent observer and such a, uh, such a beautiful writer as well that uh, looking, looking at his life, uh, as a nexus of political and social and, and cultural forces. I think that's what's important about biography. It's, it's uh, as, as uh, Katz uh, had it, it's the life and times. And I think good biographies do that. I think they integrate the life with the times, the life history and the historical moment as uh, um, uh, Eric Erickson put it, and as I invoke in the book, so I think uh, the two illuminate each other. That, that's kind of a squishy answer, but that's about the best I can do. Thank you, uh, Mauricio. Hi, Mauricio. Mauricio, you're muted. Uh, very nice to to see you, Professor Van Jong. Uh, uh, very wonderful book, uh, um, a great achievement. Much congratulations. Thank you. I, I don't have a question. I just have two comments. I, I, I think I uh, disagree with you in the sense that uh, 
Alaman is not red. Uh, I think he has been very influential in your own mentor, David Braden. Andres Lira is a great reader of Alaman. And I think Daniel Cosio Villegas, well read, is a great reader of Alaman. And if you consider the three of them are as nostalgic and melancholic also or of a, of a past. Uh, and the second is, um, I think that that might be the problem of Mexico. The liberals are not real liberals and the reactionaries are not real reactionaries. <laughs> uh, and so that might be the problem. But you often quote uh, uh, Hamilton, uh, but I, 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 I feel like uh, Alamán, as you say, wonderfully explained how he was a failure as an entrepreneur, um, a very smart man, but also as a Machiavelli, he was a uh, failure. Uh, uh, he was not a failure as a historian, as you say. Um, but uh, uh, I go back to Machiavelli, you know, uh, the, uh, 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 when you have the virtut, uh, you need the moment. If you have the moment, but you don't have the virtut, it's a failure. If you have the virtue, but you don't have the right moment, it's a failure. And you often said, you know, it, it, this will finally be rich in the Porfiriato. And as such, I think uh, Alaman uh, was close. Uh, you read Alaman, you know, it's often the, the idea of Brazil is a kind of Joseph Bonifacio or one Navi, Jose Bo Joseph Bonifacio, that could come to, could, could take the nation, could create the nation without destroying the former state, somehow survive it. Not with a king, maybe he was willing to compromise, as you say. Okay, no king, but let's save the structures of the state. Uh, uh, and also, uh, and I wonder whether uh, you found any reference because the other two characters are Spanish. Uh, Jose uh, Juan Donoso Cortes, the great Spanish reactionary, very as smart as Alaman, a, a bit more reactionary, and almost almost contemporaries. So wonder, I wonder whether they, they, they you found anything. Uh, relation with him. And the second is the Alaman that he, the Alaman, because Donoso Cortes was also a failure because of the moment uh, they were living. The real successful one was Canovas del Castillo, also a historian, also a Machiavelli, and he worked La Restauración Española uh, after 1876. Um, and, but I think you are right. It was a failure maybe because of the moment. Uh, a great reactionary, a very smart, a great historian, who I think is still uh, quietly in many famous, of my, uh, famous um, professors of mine. Uh, thanks, Mauricio. That's a very good commentary, I think. Um, two things I want to respond to. One, your observation that the liberals are not really liberal and the, and the conservatives are not really conservative. Uh, they do overlap a good deal and that's been pointed out by a number of people. Uh, and there are any number of ways in which uh, programmatically they're quite similar. It's the question of the means to the end that differentiated them, I think. And, and then even not so much. Uh, and then the point about uh, whether Alaman is red. My uh, allusion to that is that today, for example, I mean, I don't know if you're reading him in your seminars, for example, uh, he, he's, 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 he's sort of, he's, he's, a, he's an iconic figure historiographically that nobody reads today. Uh, I mean, great, as you point out, Cosío Villegas and other, you know, major modern uh, historians have, have, have uh, uh, read him a good deal, but I don't mean that he's widely, widely read. On the other hand, probably Bustamante is not either, although at the time, at the time he was, uh, you know, extremely, I mean, you, you know, uh, uh, it's interesting, uh, the correspondence between, and I'm getting off, track here as I often do. The correspondence between uh, uh, Prescott and uh, Calderón de la Barca, which is really very interesting. Um, Prescott refers to uh, Bustamante as a sorry ranting bigot, which I think was really kind of 
really kind of funny. Anyway, I thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Uh, Camilo, you have the last question. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a it's it, it's a very small question, um, and and thank you for for the talk and for the book. I read a uh, small part of it. Uh, I I I'm I'm curious about um, what happened to those sources that you mentioned at the beginning that Valadez had access to, and that apparently were later lost or or you, or you were not given access to. Do, um, yeah, what what happened to that? Where, where are they? This is a, a somewhat delicate issue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I. Sin Diego Baladez. Yeah. Well. Uh, don't be uh, don't be that polite, Eric. It's it's part of the patrimonialism of Mexico. <laughs> okay. Uh, nowadays, we have to keep, keep up with these pijos Mexicanos who keep the papers. <laughs> Okay, Valadez frequently cites documents in possession of the author. The do those documents, as far as I know, were inherited by his son, Diego Valadez. Uh, I asked several times and through the intervention of a number of people, uh, uh, including uh, people like Gisela von Bobser or uh, Javier Garcia Diego and a number of other people to get access to these documents. But uh, the answer was no. So, uh, you know, what those documents are, uh, you know, whether they involve personal correspondence. I mean, Aleman was frequently traveling, for example. He must have corresponded with his wife and with his, his two elder sons to whom he was very close, one a priest and one a lawyer, but all, virtually nothing of that exists. Uh, I did happen upon a, a series of letters with, um, Mieri Terran, the military man and, and uh, a, a politician, uh, they had a very uh, close friendship. Uh, those letters are very revealing uh, of you know, their observations on politics and things like that. So uh, you know, there must have been a lot of personal family correspondence. And I just don't know what happened to it. Now, whether it's in that uh, Valadez collection were not, I don't know whether it was destroyed subsequently by members of the family, whether it's considered to be indiscreet or too revealing or whether it compromised the, the rather uh, kind of buttoned up haute bourgeois image of, of Aleman or not, I don't know, but uh, I simply uh, couldn't uh, encounter anything like that. I wish I had. Uh, I'll tell you though, uh, that short of some smoking gun revelation, I don't have the sense that, that had I had access to that documentation that it would have made that much difference. Now this may be a defensive posture of a biographer who you know, used certain sources rather than others, um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied that uh, uh, what I found the documentation, in the documentation both corroborates and overlaps with what all of this found. So uh, in that sense, I'm not sure there was that huge of a loss. Thank you. Uh, we're out of time. So all that remains now is to thank Eric Van Young for joining us today, uh, for first of all, writing uh, such a wonderful book and also for sharing his thoughts um, and his reflections with us. Uh, thanks to all of you as well uh, for being here. And I look forward to seeing you again before too long. Goodbye. Thank you all.